you will never drift apart. You will never end up waking up and look at each other and say, we just don't have anything in common. I don't know why we're together. It just feels like we're a million miles away. There will be intimacy and goodwill and you will feel closeness because you can make those decisions right now. I'm gonna read through 10 things. And I'm gonna read through these. I'm gonna to have to go a little bit quickly through these, but if you're taking notes, you can kind of maybe summarize these real quickly. Here are 10 decisions that I'm recommending that you make before the emotion happens, then be true to these, these decisions. Number one, we are married for life and divorce is not an option. We will not, the divorce is the devil's word. We're either gonna walk, work out our problems or be two old unhappy people. <laughs> we, we are not going to, divorce is the devil's word and you can't use that word without allowing him into your house. And if the, the devil knows that divorce is an option for you, the only thing he knows is all he has to do is make the things come true that will make you divorce. But covenant means this is a permanent sacrificial relationship and it's till death to us part. Come hell or high water, we're married. We're going to work out our problems. We're going to roll up our sleeves and we're going to work this thing out. And you can if you make that decision. Make that. Number two, we will not go to bed angry. We're gonna, what I find out is the later it gets, the more humble I become. <laughs> Eight or nine at night, I'm all good. I've got all a lot of fight in me. You know, because we go to bed early. Nine or 10 at night, I'm, you know, I'm not quite as sure that I'm all right. 11 or 12 at night, it's probably my fault. <laughs> After midnight, it's definitely my fault. And, well, I'm sorry, can we go to bed? We're not gonna, we're not gonna be grudge holders. We're not gonna be old, unhappy people. We're going to work out our problems. We're not going to bed angry. We're not going to let Diabolos come and slander each other. Number three, we will never agree to disagree. In every marriage, there will be an issue that we cannot solve on our own. And getting help is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of wisdom. People who succeed are teachable. People, and you guys are, te you guys are the most teachable people you know, uh, in South Carolina, you're in a, a marriage conference. I'm serious about that. People have chronically bad marriages, never darken the door of a marriage conference, never read a book or anything like that. You guys are teachable and you are going to succeed in marriage. I can tell you that right now. You've sat here all day long, I promise. If Karen and I cannot agree on an issue, we go get help. We had an issue with our daughter when our daughter was younger and uh, maybe Julie was around 13 or 14. I can't remember. But we just had a, we had a disagreement and we couldn't solve it. We had a good marriage, but, but we couldn't solve it. So we went to our church, uh, the church I pastored, and we had a counselor on our staff that we both trusted. Her name was Ann. And so we went into Ann's office um, and we said, we have a problem with Julie that we can't solve uh, and that we are disagreeing about. And we just want you to solve this problem. And so uh, Ann said, great. So, so she said, just tell me, Jimmy, tell me your side. And Karen, tell me your side. So I told her my side and Karen told her her side. And um, she said, uh, immediately after hearing both sides, she looked and said, Jimmy, you're wrong. I said, Jezebel. <laughs> I fire you in the name of Jesus. No. So here's, here's what I said. I promise I said this. I said, we don't shop counseling. We submit to counseling. Amen. We come to people who are godly that we respect and you're God's voice to us. And I said, I don't understand, but I submit. Okay, I'm going to go back because Julie's 43. So you're talking about many years ago. I was wrong. I, I, didn't, I didn't think I was wrong. I was wrong. I'm so glad that Karen and I didn't agree to disagree. I'm so glad that we went to counseling and submitted to counseling because we needed someone to be objective. Did you know when you're hurting, you're not objective? It's the worst time to be making a decision. A God, no, never go to an ungodly person for advice. Go to a godly person and never go to anyone unsuccessful for advice. Find someone who is good at marriage, they're good at whatever, and go to them and say, would you help us? And submit to it. We'll never agree to disagree. We're, we're going to find a place of agreement. Number four, we will respect each other and celebrate each other's differences. 
there are three types of differences in marriage. There's rejected, tolerated, and celebrated. We're, we're different. We're different by God's design. But the worst marriages in the world are two people just constantly judging each other and rejecting each other. It's devastating. But tolerated differences is like this. It's like women. Can't live with them, can't live without them. Well, gee, that's real happy. <laughs> celebrated difference is this. Aren't we a great team? Man, we're Team Evans. We're, you know, we're like this. You know, we, we fit so well together. I mean, you think these thoughts, I've never thought those thoughts in my life. You're brilliant. <laughs> you know, I, I do this well, you do this well. I mean, aren't we a fantastic team? See, it's the old saying, if both of you are the same, one of you is unnecessary. <laughs> but somehow, sometimes we get the concept that if we're supposed to marry someone who's just like us, wouldn't that be the most boring thing in the world? And you're sitting around the house saying, you know what? And you go, yeah. <laughs> what? What's it? Number five, and I gotta go quickly here. Uh, decision, we will give each other the right to complain and be honest without paying a price. See, a lot of times in marriage, the reason that we don't talk openly is because we're threatened, we're defensive. And so the point is, my feelings may be wrong, but they're real. I'm not saying that what I'm going to say to you is right. See, criticizing is a dangerous thing in marriage if you're going to complain to your spouse because criticizing says you're this and you're just like your mother and you're just like your father. And, you, and it's like, whoa, you know, we get real defensive. Complaining is saying this, honey, I don't know what you meant by that, you know, but can I tell you how I feel? I, I just, and I want you to talk this feeling. So the point is, in a good marriage, there's a customer relations counter. I want to be the best store I can be. And if I've given you bad merchandise or I'm not taking care of you, baby, you come up because I want to be your department store of love. <laughs> My favorite stores are the stores you go up, you put something on the counter and they just take it and say, okay, yeah, go get you another one. Or, you know, those are the good, best marriages. We, we are going to give each other the right to complain without paying a price. Number six, we will be sexually faithful to each other and never allow our hearts to be turned away. Uh, Hebrews 13 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is God speaking to us. Adultery begins when you turn your heart away. Sexual infidelity does not start when you jump in bed with somebody else. Sexual infidelity begins when we go through a hard time and we get offended. Pastor Brad was talking about that. You're, you're going through the fire and all of a sudden your heart just turns away and shifts. Here's what it means. See, here's what God says to us. I will never leave you. That's physical. I will never forsake you. That's emotional. You can be sitting next to a person whose heart is a million miles away. In the most difficult time in our marriage, I'm turning in, not out. I'm not going to fantasize about other people. I'm not going to lean outside of our marriage and give up. I will never leave you and I will never turn my heart away. We are going to be sexually faithful, not just on the outside, but the inside. Number seven, we will be connected and accountable to our local church and develop healthy relationships with fellow believers. What a wonderful church this is. I know not everybody goes to this church, but we need great churches like this one. Adultery and divorce runs in groups. Your friends are your future. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. You will be like your friends. The local church is the best place on earth to meet friends and be in an accountable, godly environment. We need people who encourage us to do the right thing when we're going through hard times. We need people who share our faith and our values. We don't need people who pressure us to sin and encourage us to do the wrong thing. Uh, go to happy hour when we're being tempted or, you know, talk bad about our spouse when we're going through a tough time. Number eight, we will make all of our decisions together and not bully or demean each other's opinion. Karen and I always make every, every big decision in our family, significant decision, we make together. And um, we're very different. I mean, Karen and I just have a different perspective on things. But, but here's what I know. If Karen does not agree on something, this is God speaking. If Karen doesn't agree, it's either not God or it's not God now. But if, if we're, any decision we're talking about, and we're praying about it, and we're talking about it, um, and Karen says, Jimmy, I just don't agree with that, great. It, it's far, great. Because the unity of our marriage is more important than any other decision we're going to make. 
buying a car, buying a house, going on vacation, whatever it is that we're talking about doing, if we, if we have all the trappings of success and are not happy in our home, is it really worth it? So we're going to be one in everything. Number nine, we're going to prioritize our marriage above everything else and work hard to meet each other's needs. Our marriage is number one. And number 10, our marriage is covenant-based and sacrificial. We are expecting difficulty, and we're not going to start whining about it when it comes. The number one reason for divorce is not sex, money, or children. The number one reason for divorce is disappointment. People get married. They're expecting the, all these things to happen that are, that are just not going to happen. And then when it doesn't, they get their hearts broken. And the point is this. Our vows that we're going to say here in just a minute says, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness, and in health. Covenant vows say we expect difficulty. A covenant means to cut. It means this is a sacrificial relationship. And so there are going to be difficult times when we're going through things. What are we going to do in those times? We're going to work at it. We're going to get through it by the, by the help of God. Like Pastor Brad was talking about, talking about going through the fire. We're going to get through this by the help of God. But this is a covenant-based relationship. And we're not weak, emotionally-based people who make our decisions based on emotion and can't stand during the tough times. We were built through the tough times because this is a covenant-based marriage. So these are, these are 10 decisions. And my encouragement to you is even in your date night, or in your time together, maybe go back and review these and say, honey, are we committed to this? Is this something that, that we're committed to? But I'll say this, if you make these decisions and live true to them, you're going to have a fantastic marriage and you're going to grow together. And in those times that you're going through difficulty, the devil will not be able to use anger, fear, or anything else to get you to make an emotional decision that you're going to regret later. Number two, and I'll go through these pretty quickly. The purpose of our lives is connected and mutually respected. This is number two. First is we don't make emotional decisions. Okay, number two. The purpose of our lives is connected and mutually respected. This is Genesis 1. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over all the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God made man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Now, Genesis 1 is an overview of creation. Genesis 2 tells the detail of the story. So it says in Genesis 1, God blessed them, the couple, not man. He blessed them in Genesis 2. Now we're giving the detail, given the detail, Genesis 2, 18, the Lord God said, it is not good that man would be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. God's blessing is on us together, not us separately. And you can't get God to bless you separately. Let me give you an example of this. 1 Peter 3, 7, husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Any man who tries to ascend without his wife is a chauvinist. And God won't bless you. He says, you live with your wives, husbands, with understanding. As a fellow heir of the grace of life, God put you together, the grace of life, and if you try to leave her behind, your prayers will be hindered. And I say this to men, you're never doing better with God than you are with your wife. Wow. And that's, you know, that's not always good news. Karen knows that scripture, by the way, and she, <laughs> she's like the Holy Spirit. She convicts me of sin. You can't leave home without her. God blessed them and God said to them, and that is this, you will never ascend higher than your wife does. You're one. It's not good that that man would be alone. I'm putting him together with a woman. And you're going to have to treat her as a fellow heir. This is Ephesians 5 talking to women. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let their wives be their husbands and everything. You can't ascend back past your husband. We're submitted to one another in the fear of Christ and men are submitted to women and we are one. But wives, you can't, you can't go without your husband. The husband is the head of the wife and just as you are subject to Christ, 
You be to your husband everything. See, Eve was the first feminist and Adam was the first chauvinist. Eve acted without Adam and God in eating the fruit. And as soon as she did it, Adam threw her under the bus and said, she's the problem. I can get there. She said, I don't need a man. I can make my own decision. And then Adam said, I don't need a woman. I can do it without her. And God says, I, I beg your pardon. I put you together. Now listen, you have to find your together purpose. God put you together for a reason. Why do you grow apart? Because you're just two strangers living in the same house. And you think just because you're sharing a house or sharing children or sharing a checkbook or something, that makes you close. It does not make you close. What makes you close is waking up every morning saying, together we're trying to accomplish something. And it's going to take both of us. I counseled a couple. They were worth several hundred million dollars. They were famous. And a friend of mine asked if I would talk to him, and I went to talk to him. They lived in this palatial mansion um, in North Dallas. And I walked into the house, and she had already left him. She only came back because I agreed to talk to him. And she told this simple story. She said, me and the children sit over there in that side of the house every night because uh, that's the only place in the house that we can sit. This house is so uncomfortable. She said, he built this before he married me. This is his trophy house. She said, there's, it's stupid. She said, the way he designed it is stupid. There's not a, a nice, a comfortable piece of furniture in the house. And we sit over here all night and he goes into his office on the other side of the house and plays uh, poker online. We're several hundred million dollars. And I looked at him and I said, marriage is about sharing. And he said, what? I said, did you get married so you could sit at different out ends of the house having nothing in common? Or did you get married to share? He said, we got married to share. I said, you're not doing a very good job of it. And it wasn't her fault. He was a, you know, jet setter and going all over the world trying to do all this stuff had nothing in common with his wife and kids. And they were completely separate. So here's what I'm saying. In the book of Genesis, God told Adam and Eve to do two things. Be fruitful and multiply and take dominion over the earth. Let me tell you two things that you were created to do together. Raise godly children and expand the kingdom of God. Wow. You say, why, why are you and Karen together? Very simple. Karen and I want to raise godly children and grandchildren and leave a legacy of godliness. And we want the kingdom of God to expand because of us. Those are the two together purposes that keep us together. And I'm saying to all of us in here, what is your together purpose? Don't, don't get absorbed in yourself. See, some people say, well, I need to get an education. Well, I want to be successful. I'm running for this office or something like that. Is that a together? Are you agreed on that? I would not be in ministry if Karen didn't agree. And I would leave ministry without any resentment whatsoever because Karen Evans is more important to me than anything else. Our together purpose, if you don't have a together purpose that is the main reason that you're together and living, you'll drift apart. You make emotional decisions. You don't have a together purpose. And here's the last thing, and we'll do our vow renewal. And that is we're growing in our relationship with Christ. And growing in our relationship with Christ just means the best thing for us is for the Holy Spirit to draw us together. Uh, Galatians chapter 5 says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the personality of the Lord and he gives it away for free every time we ask. And when we wake up in the morning and we go to the Holy Spirit and we pray the prayer that he loves, here's the prayer that he loves. I need you. I need you in my life. I need you in my marriage. The Holy Spirit dramatically changes our personalities when we're dependent upon him. Karen and I pursue the Lord individually and together. And that's why we grow together. Because we're growing in God, we're growing together. If we were not growing in God, we would drift apart. So I say this. You can make decisions, these simple decisions, and what it means is you will never drift apart. You will never end up waking up and look at each other and say, we just don't have anything in common. I don't know why we're together. It just feels like we're a million miles away. There will be intimacy and goodwill, and you will feel closeness because you can make those decisions right now.